I think Canada is in a very good position to actually help out in uh, human rights and other things that are happening abroad. But uh, its umbilical cord to the mining corporation seems uh, to hold it from actually doing precisely that. Hello, and welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, mini season three, Everyday Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the key questions and challenges in the field of environmental politics today. And I'm Ryan Castrozine from the University of Ottawa. And with me here today is my co host for the show, Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University. How are you doing today, Peter? I'm doing well, Ryan. And I'm looking forward to talking with you today about mining, the environment, and human rights. Well, that makes two of us. How can we confront the environmental and human rights challenges associated with Canadian mining overseas? That's the question we're looking at today. The mining of minerals is hugely important in our world, uh, both for providing raw inputs that go into the technologies and goods that are associated with the traditional fossil fuel economy, but more importantly, they provide you know some of the critical minerals that are needed for a net zero economy, whether that's lithium in car batteries uh, or the copper and other elements that we need in our cell phones and laptops so that we can have online meetings rather than flying around to meet one another as often as we have in the in the past and so on. And so to be frank, you know, these minerals and at least a certain amount of the mining needed to get them out of the ground, those are here to stay even in a post fossil fuel economy. But if that's the case, then we have some big issues to address in terms of the environmental and human rights impacts associated with some parts of this industry today, both in Canada and especially overseas. And Canadian companies play a particularly important role in all of this, and we're going to be talking about that today. As a result, Canadian citizens really need to understand this industry and its associated issues and the roles that we can play as everyday eco-citizens to set this industry on a more sustainable and just path moving forward. That's all very true, Ryan. And I'm glad you're emphasizing how Canadians fit into this picture. Many Canadians may not know that mining companies uh, based in this country have a disproportionate role in the global mining industry. I've been learning quite a bit about this from my fourth year student, Sophie Ellebracht, who's writing her honors research essay on the question of governing Canadian mining companies overseas. Sophie's research tells me that in 2019, six Canadian mining companies were ranked in the top 40 global mining companies by Price Waterhouse Coopers. Including domestic mines, there are 1,290 Canadian mining and exploration companies, again in 2019, with Canadian mining assets valued at a total of $263 billion US. Over half of those companies were located overseas, and they accounted for almost 180 billion US dollars in mining assets. So this is a huge business for Canada, both domestically and overseas. At the same time, there's a lot of controversy surrounding some of those mining companies and their practices, both in Canada and overseas. And as you said earlier, we're really gonna focus today on the companies that operate outside Canada's borders. Canadian companies are purported to be responsible for a range of human rights and environmental abuses in various countries that they work in, endangering the health of local communities and destroying local environments in the pursuit of minerals. I could get into some specific examples here, Ryan, including cases where Canadian companies have admitted wrongdoing after being challenged in courts abroad. But instead, I think the best way to put a human face on all of this is to introduce the first person I spoke with, Chandu Claver and share his story with our listeners. My name is Chan Duclaver. I belong to the Bontok Igro tribe of the Northern Philippines. I was a practicing physician surgeon for 22 years. I'm also a longtime advocate and activist for human rights, especially of indigenous rights and on the issues of uh, extractive industries, particularly mining. So as you've heard, Ryan, Chandu is from an indigenous tribe in the Philippines. He's currently spokesperson for an organization of Indigenous peoples from the Northern Philippines called the Cordillera People's Alliance. 
Chandu became an activist on human rights issues related to the work of foreign companies operating in his country because of where he was born and grew up, and he'll explain that here. I was born in the premises of one of the largest copper mines in the world at the time, the Lepanto Consolidated Mining Company. In the late 80s, it partnered with a Canadian mining corporation, Ivanhoe. Their operation resulted in the environmental destruction, foremost of which was the killing of the eastern portion of the Great Abra River, a river that was vital to the survival of farmers and indigenous peoples of the provinces of Abra and Ilocos Sur. Dumping mine waste contaminated the waterway so much with silt and toxic heavy metals that it caused crop destruction, death of farm animals, disease, and starvation. My goodness, uh, that is a, a rather disturbing image that uh, Chandu is painting for us here. Uh, this is clearly a topic of, about which Chandu has extensive firsthand knowledge through direct experience with uh, some Canadian mining companies. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Well, we'll, we'll go straight back to Chando here. He's quick to point out that uh, his direct experiences with Ivanhoe is really just the tip of the iceberg. Ivanhoe was just one Canadian mining company. There are many others. They operate mostly in indigenous people's land. A growing resistance among our people to what we have come to call development aggression. Chandu went to talk about how indigenous people in the Philippines have been working to try to end this development aggression, mostly by trying to pressure their own state to better control foreign mining companies. So over the years, indigenous peoples have put forward petitions, they've held protests, and in some cases even resorted to armed defense of their lands. The response of the Philippine government has mostly been to side with the foreign companies and against indigenous resistance, whether directly through its own armed forces or indirectly by encouraging paramilitary and vigilante forces opposed to the efforts of indigenous peoples protecting their own communities and their lands. Toronto Ventures Incorporated, using its guards armed and trained by the Philippine army to displace local indigenous folks is one extensively documented example. In fact, Chandu's own family was subjected to this persecution. This is why he and the remnants of his family came to Canada as a political refugee over 10 years ago. Chandu tells that story in this clip, after I asked him if he was ever threatened himself by these paramilitary forces supported by the Philippine state in the name of protecting mining companies. Actually, it was, uh, it was not the paramilitary groups. It was the... Uh covert forces of the Philippine state, uh, the military covert uh, units that uh, were doing a lot of uh, extrajudicial killings. And uh, on, the, on July 31 in 2006, uh, they ambushed my family uh, in the middle of uh, a populated area. And it resulted in the death of my wife and uh, me being seriously hit, as well as my uh, one of my daughters. And uh, that's uh, the attack that uh, the Philippine state uh, conducted on us. My goodness, that's just horrific to hear, Peter. It's actually just hard to come to grips with how significantly his life has been affected by this. And mostly, I just appreciate his willingness to share his story with us today. And I think he has important things to teach uh, us and our listeners. So what did he have to say about what Canadians need to know about how our mining sector is operating overseas based on his personal experiences? Well, I asked him that very question and, and here's his response. Yeah, it's good you asked me that question because uh, in my, uh, my years uh, here in Canada, I did notice that uh, the knowledge about what's happening to us overseas is not uh, it's not something that uh, ordinary Canadians know about. So as an example, Chandu told me a little more about Ivanhoe, the company he had mentioned earlier. When the Cordillera People's Alliance investigated this company, they learned that one of the top 15 shareholders in the company was none other than the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. 
Chandu doubted that those teachers knew that their pensions were invested in a company whose actions were resulting in massive fish kills and destroying agricultural land in countries overseas. Well, I think that's a fair thing to doubt. I'm not quite sure I even know what my own pension fund is invested in at the University of Ottawa. So I think, you know, what Chandu is is pointing out here is that part of the problem is that, you know, these pockets of financial capital, like the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, is actively supporting activities overseas uh, that, you know, those who technically own the capital don't really know about. Um, and so I'm curious to know, you know, what, what else did he say about how this system works? You know, when you mentioned uh, earlier the Philippine government playing a role in supporting the mining companies, what's the role of the Philippine state in all of this? That's a good question, Ryan. And in fact, at least some of the blame for what's happening in the Philippines does need to be placed at the hands of its own state which Chandu pointed out is controlled by a small ruling elite of less than 170 families. So he pointed out that the Philippine government brought in a very important piece of legislation that has made all of this possible, and that was in 1995, the Philippine Mining Act. This piece of legislation was developed in close consultation with international mining bodies. This act practically opened up the whole Philippine mining industry to foreign corporate mining. As a result, a flood of foreign corporations coming from many countries, but most of whom are registered here in Canada, have actually put in exploration applications and their existing mining operations have even expanded further. Canadian companies, as well as other mining corporations from other countries, are well protected and encouraged by the ruling class in the Philippines the ruling class which controls government, policies, institutions, armed forces, and the police. They work in concert to realize corporate interests and profit, even in the face of people's opposition. So I tried to get more clarity from Chandu on the role of this domestic legislation, since it seems to be really critical to the story we're hearing. Here's what he said. The Philippine Mining Act is so well biased towards corporations. It gives them all the benefits. It it basically gives them uh, 80,000 hectares to start with. And then after you are able to locate where you're putting up your mine in that uh, area, you have the right to ease out any person or any population that is living in that area. You have prior rights to the water. You have prior rights to everything. That is what uh, the Philippine Mining Act does. And it was made in consonance between the ruling classes and the corporations. That's quite interesting. So we're seeing a whole range of players here from, you know, the investors that are putting up the financial capital, the actual corporations, the mining corporations that are involved in development, and in particular, the Philippine government. Uh, which is facilitating this process. And, you know, while we're talking about governments and how they facilitate the industry, what did Chandu have to say about the role of the Canadian government in all of this? Yeah, that's a good question, Ryan. Uh, Chandu pointed out that Canadian mining companies have received diplomatic support and funding by agencies like Export Development Canada, as well as the Canadian International Development Agency, or CEDA, which is now part of uh, Global Affairs Canada. These two entities regularly pump millions into mining operations in notoriously troubled foreign areas, and that includes the Philippines. Chandu went to point out some of the reasons why Canada is such a big player in the global mining industry, arguing it's a combination of the politically economic history of Canada, which involves a lot of domestic mining, of course, combined with a rather lax regulatory system for these companies. So as an example, he pointed out that publicly traded mining companies listed on Canadian stock exchanges are subject to regulations that enable them to appear to have greater mineral reserves than they actually have confirmed knowledge of, thereby encouraging more investment in what could be considered highly risky ventures. Most Canadian financial institutions, mutual funds, and major private, public, and union pension funds, including 
the Canada Pension Plan are heavily invested in this, which I call shadowy enterprises. So again, here he's you know he's making me think of my own pension fund, and I imagine yours at Carlton, Peter, um, and that of many other Canadians. Uh, so Chandu seems to be pointing out that most Canadians are likely investors in one way or another in Canadian mining companies, which are involved in foreign uh, operations abroad, which may be contributing to some of these social and environmental challenges that we've just been hearing about. Is that right? Yeah, that's a good way of summing it up, Ryan. And that's exactly what Chandu said. This is the aspect of investment that shareholders in Canada never get to see. The individual Canadian shareholder who puts in his or her hard-earned money to be invested is so well insulated from the knowledge of what his or her money is actually enabling in faraway countries. The investor never sees the tears, never sees the blood, the dead bodies, never feels the horror, never tastes the fear. And the Canadian state, unfortunately, permits and even encourages that. So, Peter, Chandu has shared with us a really important and personal story. And what we've heard so far is that, you know, when environmental and human rights abuses occur in the global mining industry, we can allocate some of the responsibility for this in a couple different directions. You know, we can talk about the state where the mining activity is taking place. So in this case, the Philippines and the government of the Philippines. We can talk about the stock exchanges and the regulatory systems of the countries where these companies are headquartered and where, you know, financial capital uh, and important investments are being raised for these companies to use in their uh, operations. And for many major mining companies around the world, that really is Canada. And that brings up the role of the Canadian government as well, which I think we're going to talk about later in this episode. So I know you talked a bit with Chandu about how these issues can be addressed, but let's first hear from uh, some of our other guests. So who was the next person you talked about to these issues with? Well, let me introduce you to Teresa to bring a new perspective to the table. I'm Teresa Kramars, and I am an associate professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy in the University of Toronto. I uh, work on global environmental politics, and I focus on questions of environmental accountability and governance of extractive industries. I've been working particularly around the issue of renewable energy, solar, wind, and long-life battery storage, and the kinds of critical minerals and supply chain of these critical minerals required in order to produce, um, you know, solar panels and wind turbines, et cetera, in order to mitigate climate change. Yes, Teresa, she's actually a colleague of mine uh, who I know, and and I think she can really bring a macro level perspective to some of the issues we're talking about in this episode. Yeah, that's right, Ryan. Teresa studies the way that extractive industries like mining for critical elements affects communities. And she also thinks a lot about what can be done to address those issues at various levels. So we'll get to this question of policy and solutions shortly. But first, I want to share some clips that helped me really understand the different kinds of socio-ecological harms, is how Teresa puts it, what she calls displacements that communities can experience as a result of extractive activities like mining. When we think of socio-ecological harms associated with extractive activities, we can think about three broad categories. One is the kinds of displacements that are generated through dispossession. So think of land grabs, but more broadly, when we think in the context of controlling land and commodifying by separating land from labor, there's a a new extractive regime that emerges. The vehicles to dispossession are probably like property rights or uh, mining concessions or constitutional provisions, you know, contracts that create 
and convert land uh, into resources for extraction and accumulation. That's one sort of bucket of displacements. Another is uh, displacements by degradation. So think here in terms of the kinds of harms that uh, are generated to human health, to ecosystem health. And this exists a lot at the extractive end. So whenever I'm thinking of mining and minerals, I'm thinking of extraction, transportation, production, and then disposal. And so there's a lot of human health and ecosystem damages that are usually associated with the extractive stage of this of the supply chain. And then the third one is through dependent development, or sometimes called maldevelopment. This is the ways in which extractive activities kind of entrench development pathways in ways that lock local economies, national economies into low value forms of of resource extraction or become waste disposal sites. I see what she's saying here. So local communities first face the socio-ecological harms that Teresa refers to as displacement by dispossession. And then there's displacement by degradation or whether, you know, that degradation is associated with the extractive processes themselves or how the system deals with waste. And then we have the effects of the development processes themselves that are now highly dependent on these extractive and often harmful activities. Yeah, that's right. And part of the reason Teresa sets up this typology is to point out that when we hear about a mining disaster, and she gave me several examples, uh, much like the story that Chandu uh, started with, these are kind of like the tip of the iceberg, and we need to see the whole thing to make sense of it. So these are big and fast environmental disasters that capture people's attentions and do create vulnerable subjects, but they're also the ones that are sort of death by a thousand cuts. So the ones that are structurally uh, happening every day, that are uh, every day contaminating water sources, that are every day Uh, undermining people's ability to um, uh, grow their economies in ways beyond the real direct relationship with an an industry. And then that intersects with what are the community uh, or household's ability to respond to these disasters, to these fast disasters and these slow disasters. Okay, so we often hear about the fast disasters, I think is what she's saying. But the slow disasters are kind of just as impactful, if not more, on a day-to-day level for the people living with extractive industries and near extractive projects around the world. Is that right? Yeah. And I quickly turned my conversation with Teresa to the question of who is really accountable for all of this and how does this affect what we can do in a country like Canada to try to take things in a more sustainable direction? On the question of who is accountable... Teresa told a similar story to Chandu, noting that the governments of the states where extraction is taking place, in Chandu's case, that was the Philippines, they definitely have some responsibility, but we can't only look to them. And for her, this has to do with what she calls the architecture for accountability. These are global chains. These are global value, global supply chains. And so the fact that we have states as our unit of analysis doesn't really correspond with the nature of the interaction. It's not a good fit. I mean, it's not the appropriate architecture for accountability relationships because the state is actually using these communities and these in ex- pushing extractive frontiers um, in order to fit within a broader economic order in which itself is often relegated to, and I'm speaking mostly of minerals and, uh, and extraction sites in the global south, it's mostly relegated to a role of producer where it doesn't have uh, the same kind of leverage to demand accountability and force rules um, as other states with more diversified economies, for example, might. That's interesting. So it sounds like Teresa is really thinking about how governance can work, but also how it often can't or, quite frankly, doesn't work. That's right. And, and in fact, Teresa and I spoke a bit about what she called uh, accountability gaps and traps in what states and companies are currently doing, especially as it relates to the minerals needed for a renewable energy transition. 
So gaps, we refer to it as absence of governance. Uh, and traps, we think of in terms of governance that's accountable, but it's accountable for meeting its own metrics rather than socioecological outcomes. So um, I said I would invite, I don't know, three communities to a uh, workshop in order to explain to them what the uh, project is all about. Checkbox, done. But it is not accountable for outcomes. So that's a tool. That's not, that's a means. That's not an end in itself, right? Having, I don't know, consultative workshops is not an end in itself. So that's not just a governance gap. That's, that's a trap because the company's being accountable for what it, it wants to be accountable for as opposed to what um, sociological outcomes require it to be accountable for. Okay. So we've got gaps and traps and the accountability traps include mechanisms that basically, you know, appear to kind of ensure or, or, or offer some form of accountability, but only really to the expectations of the company itself. Um, and these don't really actually hold them accountable to, especially to broader socioecological outcomes. That's right, Ryan. What Teresa is pointing to is, you know, the traps and gaps in what we might think of as a, a loose patchwork of transnational regulations that in include corporate social responsibility, but also, you know, kind of this tapestry of self-governance initiatives that uh, really have limited accountability, a uh, few sanctions. Uh, here, I'll let Teresa say more of it herself. When we look at the ecosystem, this loose patchwork, as you're aptly calling, of uh, transnational regulations that are governing the supply chain of critical minerals, we want to know, like, okay, what are the primary purposes of your rules? Who is designing these rules? Who's being held to account? To whom? For what? What minerals are getting captured and which ones are just flying under the, the radar? And we find, I think, patterns that are broadly applicable beyond these critical minerals. So we find transnational mechanisms uh, mostly are concentrating on voluntary standards and corporate practices. Most of it focuses on regulating conflict minerals rather than minerals beyond the ones that are associated with conflict. There's a lot that's not governed uh, across the supply chain of extraction, transportation, production, use, disposal. And mostly, as I mentioned, dealing with like mine waste safety and, and water use and human rights and indigenous rights protections. The other problem with depending on transnational mechanisms that are mostly voluntary and depend on corporate practices and CSR strategies is that there's this whole dependence on companies and they're, you know, how willing are they to provide the relevant data these are big trends and big important questions and reasons why there is a lot of demand for home state accountability. So I hear uh, where Teresa is coming to this idea of home state accountability, as she referred to it, you know, which is, you know, actually sounds a lot like what Chandu was saying, you know, a country like Canada, as the home state to many global mining giants has to shoulder more of the responsibility for what companies headquartered here are doing there, right? What they're doing elsewhere. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly the direction my conversation with uh, Teresa took. Rather than actively trying to reduce regulatory oversight, a country like Canada could be encouraging, even requiring, companies based here to meet higher standards. There are cases in which Canada has lobbied to, and I'm thinking of Colombia in particular, of like, you know, not expanding, but reducing the scope of regulatory oversight and environmental protections. We need to go in the opposite direction to, I don't know, create, for example, citizen advisory committees and to write them into legislation of develop of producer states um, or help producer states develop mandatory principles we derive a lot of a lot of goods as Canadians from our mines and, and mining. And so I think that there is a duty, uh, not just because the state's accountable for serving the public interest, and because the Canadian state supports the mining sector in multiple ways, both financially and politically, but because also silence means complicity, right? And uh, maybe I'll be a little controversial in saying this, but what's what's the point of saying that Canada has a gender balanced cabinet of ministers if its mining companies are raping women overseas? So it's really 
it's really important to take ownership and responsibility and push for more accountability for Canadian mining overseas. So on that point of traces, I'd like to bring Chandu back as well, uh, because he also made the case that Canada could have stronger legislation governing its industries acting overseas, and that voluntary oversight under the rubric of corporate social responsibility, uh, it just isn't enough. So to give you a bit of context, Chandu's group has been pushing for this for almost 20 years, uh, initially through public hearings. and then through what eventually became the failed attempt to get a private member's bill, known as Bill C-300, or the Corporate Accountability of Mining, Oil, and Gas Corporations in Developing Countries Act, passed in Canada back in 2011. So the act was not passed in Parliament. That was in the Harper era. But if it were, it would have put new expectations on Canadian companies. And so the Cordillera People's Alliance is still pushing for stronger legislation in Canada, demanding more accountability from our companies through Canadian legislation. We highly recommend legislation requiring Canadian corporations to conduct human rights due diligence to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for any potential adverse human rights, environmental, and gendered impacts that may happen throughout their supply chains and operations. Due diligence means that Canadian companies operating abroad and their subsidiaries and contractors would be required to undergo a process to identify risks and outline how they would not cause human rights and environmental harm. Lastly, A legislation on due diligence should include significant consequences for companies that cause harm and or fail to conduct due diligence. So Chandu pointed out that France already has legislation like this that demands companies do this due diligence and uh, that the Netherlands are developing similar legislation. But Canada just hasn't gone down this path, at least not yet. Uh, The debate over C-300 eventually led to the creation of a new institution in Canada, though, uh, something called the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise, or uh, CORE for short. So the position of the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise is relatively new. It was established only in 2019 by an order in council, and uh, its complaint form only became available for public use in March of uh, 2021, so maybe nine months ago at the time of this recording. Um, The Corps' formal mandate is to encourage companies to follow the UN guiding principles and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's guidelines uh, to advise Canadian companies on ways to create responsible business practices, look into complaints about possible human rights, and to offer informal mediation services when those complaints arise. That is an interesting development. So now there's this oversight body to which complaints can be submitted. Uh, What did our first two guests have to say about this new institution, the CORE, uh, the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise? Well, it's a good question. And let me play you uh, Teresa's response first, and then what I heard from Chandu. I think it's a great first step to have a Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise. But the Achilles heel so far is that it is really providing recommendations. It is not, you know, creating mandates and it lacks basic powers, right? To subpoena and compel documents, to uh, bring in witnesses. In a nutshell, we at the Cordillera People's Alliance consider the Canadian Ombudsman for Responsible Enterprise Program or CORE as a toothless initiative of the government of Canada. The main reason is is that it does not have the power and mandate to effectively investigate possible human rights abuses by Canadian companies working outside Canada in the mining and other industries. So you hear from both uh, Teresa and Chandu on this question where they both seem to agree uh, that this kind of institution needs more power if it's gonna be effective. Chandu's position is that the core is insufficiently independent, and uh, both say it doesn't really have the kinds of investigative powers that it needs to compel documents and testimony. 
Chandu also noted that the kind of people he works with are unlikely to bring a complaint forward to the ombudsperson, considering these constraints on the ombudsperson's role. Bringing a complaint against a multinational company carries significant risk, especially for the complainant. People will not be, they will not want to assume the serious risk of filing a complaint against a multinational company when the process they are entering into does not work. So I think it's important to point out here, uh, Chandu says the process that complainants are entering does not work. And the reality is this process in Canada only just started nine months ago. And so he's making assumptions that it will not work. Um, But part of why he's saying that is he pointed out that CORE's mandate also includes a parallel process that allows mining companies to file complaints against community representatives and other human rights defenders. And that this whole process of making your complaints publicly in this way, and then the possibility of counter action, you know, really creates a situation of vulnerability for the complainants, whether they're here in Canada or back home in in another country like the Philippines. I see. So CORE will hear out complaints from both sides, uh, and that's an interesting uh, component to this. I'm wondering, Peter, is it fair to say that the only real power CORE has here is to sort of gently encourage companies to fulfill their corporate social responsibility? Like, Do we think that having an impact on a company's reputation is going to be sufficient enough to, to make a real difference here? Well, those are good questions, Ryan. And on the question of whether that's, you know, the extent of CORE's mandate, I think we can come back to that in a second. But this question of reputational impact, I think, is an important one. And I did ask Teresa what her experience and research says we might expect from a system that relies on reputational effects. And here's how she responded. Companies are neither good nor bad, but they have a purpose. They have a purpose that is their raison d'être. They exist in order to generate goods and services at prices that are going to be adequate for producers, suppliers, consumers. Their chain of accountability is to their shareholders. So it is important to consider what is the constitutive role of these actors, you know, and not expect public functions out of a private actor. So it is the role of government to secure and protect the public good, to ask companies to take on public functions is both analytically and empirically problematic. It's to perhaps reach beyond what they are actually there for. You know, I'm sure there will be cases where reputational damages mattered, but I don't believe that this is a recipe for self-regulation. Hmm. So that's an interesting perspective on the relationship between corporate social responsibility and the role of the state. And it raises, you know, other important questions about what the core really can do, how it works, and whether it really can kind of get companies to take the high road, you know, based on potential impacts to their reputations. And I know, Peter, that you, uh, you know, while you were were working on those interviews with Chandu and Teresa, that you decided to reach out to the core directly on this. Yes, that's right, Ryan, I did. I brought some of the questions we've been dealing with to none other than Sherry Meyerhofer, who is currently the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise, occupying this new office that Teresa and Chandu just talked about. We came to an agreement with her team that Sherry would listen to the first part of this episode, and then we'd ask her some questions about how she sees her office engaging in these issues moving forward. Okay, so why don't we start by having Sherry introduce herself? My name is Sherry Meyerhofer. I'm the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise. And I lead a new Canadian innovative, arm's length independent ombuds office. The first thing I asked Sherry about is how she would characterize the issues that led to the creation of her office. And we already heard from uh, Chandu and Teresa talking about some of the human rights and environmental issues in the extractive sector and the calls for increased intervention by the Canadian government that this has led to. I wanted Sherry's perspective on why her office exists. Okay, so that's a good place to start. What did she say? 
What I found most interesting is that she didn't start with the issues that led to the call for stronger oversight. Rather, she was talking about the idea that Canada is first and foremost a country with a long history of supporting human rights, and that her office is a natural outcome of that history. Canada is proud of its commitment to protect human rights both at home and overseas, and this commitment is historic with Canada being instrumental in the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights over 70 years ago in 1948. This commitment is consistent and ongoing because Canada is a signatory and has ratified the major human rights treaties, um, declarations and covenants over this last 70 years. And our commitment means that all of our domestic laws must be compliant with international human rights documents. And companies are, of course, held accountable to comply with those when they're working within Canada. These same principles apply when Canadians or the representatives, including Canadian companies, are operating outside of Canada. But there isn't an international legal framework that can hold them accountable like we can within our own borders. And so this led to um, the creation of the United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, of which Canada, again, was a big supporter. And one of the things in that document was the state creation of non-judicial mechanisms to influence companies and to hold them accountable and help to provide remedies if and when Canadian companies are operating overseas and the human rights abuses occur and harms arise. I see. So Sherry kind of positions her office as a response to Canada's international commitment to human rights, I guess. Well, that's it. She says the core is really the Canadian manifestation albeit the first in the world and thus an institutional innovation, of Canada's commitment to the 2011 UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. Okay, so how do Sherry and her staff engage or plan to engage some of the issues like those raised by Chandu and Teresa? Good question. Sherry spoke to this by placing the core in the context of two things. One, the history and importance of Canadian mining, as well as oil and gas companies, And secondly, you know, the recent conversations in Canada about how to regulate Canada's extractive companies overseas that led to the push for Bill C-300, which I mentioned earlier. My office is a human rights ombud office. So we focus only on human rights, which is why, you know, I've explained about the international principles and those documents. We only have three sectors under our jurisdiction, under our mandate, and that's mining, uh, oil and gas, and garment. And that arises from the historic situation. I think that the data is still the same, but around 60% of the world's mining companies, for example, are based from Canada. And so if there's something that's happening overseas um, or around the world in mining, there's some harm that occurs, it's highly likely it's going to be a Canadian company. And this is a concern for a country like Canada that prides itself on um, its commitment to protecting human rights wherever they might occur in the world. Okay, so let's get to the core of all of this. And sorry for the pun. Uh, Okay, I'm not sorry. But anyway, Peter, I guess what I'm kind of wondering is, you know, how does Sherry think she can help communities in getting companies, mining companies, to actually address environmental and human rights issues? Well, that's, yeah, that's the question. And as we've already heard from Chandu and Teresa, at the heart of CORE's work is the ability to hear and act on complaints about Canadian companies overseas. This is how Sherry put it. We can receive complaints. And when we receive a complaint, we can negotiate an early resolution. We can mediate a complaint um, or we can review it. And we can also initiate our own review. So it seems good that Canada has a new mechanism to allow complaints to be heard. But at the same time, you know, we heard from Chandu that many communities and human rights advocates actually feel it's too risky to file these kinds of public complaints. Did Sherry address that? I did ask her about this, and her response emphasized that under many circumstances, complainants can actually remain anonymous as a form of protection, and that this could be enough for her office to initiate its own review or investigation of a specific situation or company's actions. People can approach us either with an inquiry, so in, you know, in a very informal way, to ask about what we do and how we do it um, without giving any specifics. So be completely anonymous and just sort of scope out how we can help them or they can submit a complaint at the same time. So if we get an inquiry, what we would describe to people is um, you can submit a complaint to us. You can do it anonymously without giving your name. 
and you could give us, you know, tell us how to get a hold of you. We will communicate with that person and tell them what we can and cannot do. There are privacy things that we can hold confidential, but not everything is confidential. If they are looking for a personal remedy, they couldn't be anonymous all the way through. But we would also tell them that we can initiate an ombud initiative review. So we can keep people's identity completely anonymous if they don't want any compensation directly to themselves. Or we could do an ombud initiative review. And what would Sherry's office be able to do once they launch a review of this type? Well, that would depend on the nature of the complaint and what the community that is impacted wants to see done. But clearly, one of the first steps would then be to engage the company involved. We could then offer up to talk to the company to find out if we could do an early resolution. What is the problem? Um, What is it they're looking for? What do they think would be a good redress remedy for the harm that they've described? We can go to the company and see what their response would be. Can this be resolved? as simply as that. Or if not, then we would next offer mediation. And that would be where we could bring both parties into a room. We can do it virtually. We can do shuttle mediation. We already have a mediator on staff and and some consultants, but we're going to have a roster of mediators around the world in different countries that speak different languages that would be third-party mediators that could work um, with the company and the complainant to come to a resolution. And the Details of that mediation could be kept private if both parties would like it to be private or certain aspects of the agreement can be made public. But in any event, we will be letting the public know that we held a mediation and that it was either successful or unsuccessful. If mediation doesn't or isn't able to resolve um, the problem and if the complainant wants to go further, we can do a review, which is an investigation of the situation we would come to some findings of fact. Based on those findings of fact, we would write up a report with recommendations to the Minister of International Trade. We would give an opportunity to the company to review that report and make their own comments. They don't have any ability to influence the findings, but they can put their own sort of statement forth, which would be part of the report. And that report is then published and available to the public. Hmm, That's interesting. So in our conversations with Teresa, we had kind of drilled into whether this type of reputational damage could really be enough to pressure companies to uphold the highest standards. So I'm curious what Sherry's take is on whether this kind of pressure, this reputational pressure, can really make a difference. Well, Sherry believes that the kinds of reports her office can write and the kinds of mediation that they can undertake And the potential damage it can do to a company if they don't engage constructively with her and the communities that bring forward complaints, she believes these can have an effect on at least two levels. Uh, There's the support of the government of Canada, and then there's the ongoing support of investors. The power that I have is soft power. It is influencing, and it's influencing through these levers. And the levers are the recommendation to withdraw trade support by the government. So the government now is not going to support a company. And depending on the country, that's pretty big for companies. Um, Without that support, it can be very difficult to operate um, outside of Canada. But if we were to do a report and publish it, and it is publicly known that a company does not have social license in one part of the world um, to do its operations, then I think investors are more and more looking into the social license and the investment risk involved when a company doesn't have it. If they haven't uh, conducted themselves responsibly, they may not get investment from private investors either, uh, which is critical. Okay, so this all has potential to influence companies and their investors, but the same issue can come up that we discussed with Teresa. What if the company ultimately decides not to engage? Or you know, what if they deny that what they did uh, was wrong? Well, that's a really important question. Uh, Both Chandu and Teresa emphasized that the core's power has its limits. And this is where I found Sherry's response uh, maybe most interesting. So she noted a couple of things. First, she can recommend that the Minister of International Trade revoke financing or trade services provided by Export Development Canada. You know, she just mentioned that. And these are precisely the ways that Chandu emphasized the Canadian government directly supports many Canadian mining companies overseas. 
And secondly, and this is really important, her mandate includes the possibility of pushing for stronger regulation in Canada if the kind of work her office is designed to do doesn't achieve the outcomes that it is designed to achieve. Hmm. So it sounds ultimately like she doesn't think her office is as toothless as some of the core's you know, critics have suggested. Yeah, that's true. In in fact, she made a point of responding directly to that criticism that she heard in the first part of the uh, the podcast. I think we have a a full uh, mouth of teeth, but we just may we may need to strengthen our jaw a little bit more. And I do believe that you know, as we receive complaints and we work towards resolution, and we um, seek to get remedies actually applied to address these harms, we will discover when and where we might um, or do need these additional tools. And that will be the evidence that we can then put, you know, forward to the government of Canada, you know, to show that it would be helpful. So, you know, I think that it's a good start. We've got a good toolbox, lots of things to work with, and that if we need more, that's going to become evident. Hmm, it's really interesting to hear the ombudsperson's own take on these questions and about the, the office itself. Uh, Peter, I'm wondering if you think it's fair to say that that for now, all of this is kind of hypothetical since, you know, ultimately this office um, was only just made fully operational in the last calendar year. That's right. So only time will tell how effective the core can be, whether it will truly affect the behavior of Canadian mining companies operating overseas or whether it will ultimately lead to calls for more stringent regulation coming from people like Sherry herself. But I want to add two things here that give me some hope that we've got the right person for this kind of job in the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise. First, even though Sherry doesn't have specific success stories to point to, the day I interviewed her, the Corps was launching its first investigation, in this case, of the garment industry. So you may have heard in passing earlier that Sherry mentioned that her mandate uncovers mining, oil and gas, and the garment industry, the clothing industry. And uh, this last bit is because, as you'll recall, in 2013, um, there was a, you know, a major catastrophe in Bangladesh, the Rana Plaza disaster, in which over a thousand garment workers, most of whom were women, died when the huge factory they were working in collapsed, uh, despite warnings having been provided to the management that the factory was weak and that this was a concern. So many of the items of clothing these women were working on were destined for the Canadian market. And so there was a lot of kind of investigative journalism at the time really trying to tell that story and show how consumers in Canada were implicated in what happened in Bangladesh. As a result, one of the first orders of business that Sherry's office is going to undertake is to do a deep review of the garment industry from a human rights perspective looking specifically at the role of child labor in the clothing industry and how we can improve Canadian supply chains, including the regulations that govern them to ensure human rights are respected in this industry. Part of our mandate is to make recommendations on law reform. And so we have launched today a study to understand um, the barriers to respecting child rights um, throughout the supply chain of Canadian garment companies that operate abroad. So we're going to be looking at what type of human uh, rights uh, due diligence um, are companies currently putting in place? And we'll look uh, specifically at child labor because child labor is an abuse of child rights. And of course, child rights are human rights and we're a human rights ombud. So this is definitely square rate within our mandate. We will gain knowledge that will help Canadian companies change the way they act if they need to or improve what they're already doing. And it'll help the uh, government of Canada to understand whether they need to do anything with our laws going forward. Well, that sounds like a very important initiative. Uh, Peter, earlier you said there were two things that gave you some confidence that Sherry might be the right person to make a difference through this office. Uh, and you mentioned one. What's the other thing? Well, remember the idea that I raised earlier in our conversation that companies can also file complaints against human rights defenders through the core. Chandu first brought this to my attention as something that raises serious concerns for community activists when they think about whether they want to engage with CORE. And indeed, Chandu was right in the sense that a parallel process for hearing company complaints was originally supposed to be part of the mandate of the CORE. 
But Sherry says she helped remove that from her mandate after she was asked to actually be the ombudsperson. When I first took office in May of 2019, that ability was included in the order and council that sets out my mandate. But after advocacy by myself as the ombudsperson in my office and also by other civil society organizations, that clause, that ability was taken out of my order and council. At the same time, the order and council was also amended to provide a much broader definition of Canadian company. So by um, August, September, a few months after I was appointed, we managed to get those improvements to the mandate of the office. I see. So Sherry, along with the advocacy of civil society organizations, really pushed for an office here that sees its work first and foremost as being about protecting human rights and doing investigations on behalf of those who believe their human rights have been violated. That's right. But as we said before, we'll have to see how this work plays out in the coming years. Yeah, I guess we'll see how things play out in the coming years. So Peter, what are your final takeaways here? Well, first, I'm really glad I did the interviews for this episode in order to understand this issue more deeply. I have enormous gratitude for Chandu, who shared his history with us, and I'm proud that he's doing the work he's doing here in Canada to raise concerns about the actions of Canadian companies overseas and to push for due diligence legislation in this country, and that's really what he emphasized. And I'm pretty convinced that we do need such legislation for the reasons Chandu presented. I'm also grateful that we have academics in this country uh, like Teresa, whose work really tries to unravel the complexity of these problems and make governance recommendations. You know, her work brings a bigger perspective to this story, and I'm so glad we were able to speak with her. And finally, I'm glad to see that governance does seem to be getting stronger. I'm not sure if the mandate of CORE is perfect, uh, but I do think it's a step forward. And I'm grateful that Sherry was willing to talk, you know, frankly with us. And it gives me hope seeing someone like her behind the wheels of this new institution. And I guess my final thoughts are that Canadians, you know, as investors and as citizens and as students learning about these issues, we need to keep our eyes on this sector and keep pushing for accountability. Given the importance of this industry to Canada, that most of international mining companies are based in Canada, you know, Canadian eco-citizens have a huge responsibility to learn about the sector and to use our power as investors and as voters in our government to hold the sector to account. So before we close this podcast, I just want to share some final thoughts from Teresa. And I think these really fit with the focus of the series on everyday ecopolitics and the kinds of reflections and actions we can take as individuals to make a difference in the world we inhabit. I think a lot about what does it mean to be sustainable and to really consider how we want to move forward. You know, climate change, biodiversity, species extinctions, these multiple environmental crises are taking us to an inflection point to really decide what are what do we value as a society and to consider what are the things that we consume and where do they come from and what were the trade-offs in producing them um, and why is this something so cheap <laughs> uh, and how much of it we need when we think about justice, think about not just the distribution of goods and bads, but think also about what kind of recognition do we give to communities, to their worldview, to their values? What kind of participation, what kind of uh, procedural justice do we afford communities who are going to be implicated in the decisions that we make? And um, and what kinds of the, the, the capabilities that communities have to be able to negotiate futures that are good for them? Uh, negotiate with mining companies, negotiate with their states, negotiate with global supply chains. That's an insightful point to close out today's episode. That does sum up today's discussion. I want to thank you, Peter, for doing all the hard work of interviewing all these people. That was fantastic. Thanks for bringing the voices of Chandu and Teresa and Sherry to our listeners today. Dear listeners, we're really curious to hear what you have to say. Get in touch. Let us know what you think on the issues we discussed uh, about in today's episode. 
What can you do to make the supply chains of the minerals we all rely on more just and more sustainable? What do you think of Canada's formal legislative efforts on this matter so far? Make sure to follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP, that's at Ecopolitics with a capital P at the end of it, and check out all of the incredible artwork and additional resources like transcripts and pedagogical materials that we've put together for each and every episode at our website, ecopoliticspodcast.ca. And now for some credits. This episode was produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning for season three is provided by Ashley Fernall. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. The podcast is made available under a Creative Commons License 2.0 Canada. Thanks for listening. Thank you.